front of the cart. Um, but back to the your fund balance. What is your goal on fund balance? Is it a percentage of your operating budget, or and what is that? So the original goal was 10%. Uh, we we are likely on pace once we once our audit is finalized in let's say January or February, we're likely to be on pace to be more in the 12 or 13 percent range already. Within the last two years, I think the the fund balance um, two years ago uh, would have been was on pace to be somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five percent. So in the last two years, working with our trustees, we've in essence been able to add about two million dollars to our fund balance. Okay. Over do, do you have a window? Do you have like a high end where you don't want to go over? Or? Well, I think that's really where we want to stabilize is in that is in that area. I mean, we can. I mean, we know. I'll give you an example. I mean, my first year I arrived here, when the budget that was developed, um, with good reason, I'm not I'm not discounting it. You know, the enrollment that came in was six percent under what the budget enrollment was. Well, right away we knew in October, this time of year, we needed to cut eight hundred thousand dollars. <coughs> in order to balance that particular budget. We did so, and actually more than that, right? But when it, comes to, when it comes to the fund balance, if you're in a position to say, well, if you miss your mark and you can't make your internal cuts mid-year to be able to balance at the end of the year, then that's what your fund balance is for. And what do we tell everybody internally? Our trustees' leadership is similar. We have one fund balance for a future that's hopefully bright and very long. So all we can do is to be able to make sure that we're doing it the right way. But at this point, we are at the point if we can keep it above 10%, <coughs> We need, to, we need to be able to invest where we need to invest and have the faculty and the staff and the other infrastructure in place to be able to be responsive. And I think we're in just a different place now. Thank you. Mr. Clark. Uh, the recent sale of Lattimore Hall, is that in relationship with the continue with the college? Or? Yeah, yep. We've, uh, our team has been meeting with, with a transition group with Lattimore Hall. It continues to be a relationship and I think an asset. You know, that, uh, that property, for years has served, has, at least in the fall, has housed um, about 90 to 95 students pretty consistently. And I think uh, another interesting note to that just is I believe, my understanding is, I may be wrong, but I believe my understanding is even on years where it was peak enrollment for the college, back in 2009 and 10, uh, 11, uh, even so during those times there wasn't necessarily an extensive wait list for, the, for, for housing need at that time. And I will tell you, those are the types of things for me that want to make sure that we continue to look at that. But the relationship's there, our students are enjoying it, we, and we're continuing to build infrastructure to support those students as well because you know, our name's on it, our relationship is there, and we want our students to feel like they're, they're comfortable and able to thrive. <coughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any committee reports or individual legislative reports? Hearing none, I have a brief report. I think as everyone knows, we do have a interim highway superintendent. Don Bowen has agreed to step up. Don comes from the Venice barn, has, has a long history, knows the department, knows our roads. The, uh, um, he made his first report to the uh, public works this, uh, this week, so he's, he's right in it. I know we all welcome him. If you see him, express your appreciation for his stepping up and for his work, what he has done, what he will do. So I want to thank Don. In a similar vein, Terry Baxter and Ben Vitale and I attended the county highway superintendents or uh, highway superintend super superintendents the meeting the uh, this month. Uh, we talked about. The, a number of issues, including some conditions of road, shared services, and so on. But it was noteworthy that that group extended this universal and significant support for Dan Bowen. And so that was very good to see and the, uh, something that, again, bodes very well for us as we move forward. The budget meetings have consumed much of my time this month. Um, we'll have an operationally balanced budget within the tax cap that I'll be presenting on Monday. I hope everyone can come. They are looking at some new new positions and the important things that we need to do to move the county forward. So that's uh, Monday, October 30th, and I think at 5.30, is that right, Mr. Graham? Yes. So I would invite everyone, encourage everyone to attend. I've also been participating in some deferred comp RFP interviews that Jenny and Delicato and Jim Orman have taken the lead on. The, uh, in addition, I think Tim Lattimore has attended 
uh, one or two of those, and Mr. McNabb Coleman. We're looking at coming back with a recommendation probably next month, I would think, uh, about our do how to move forward with our deferred comp. It's an important benefit program for our employees. And so we'll have more on that. Uh, I think probably initially at Ways and Means and then for the full ledge. So does anyone have any questions of me? Okay, great. <laughs> There are no regular monthly appointments. Can you just say communications and announcements? Communications and announcements. Move to dispense of the reading of the communications and announcements. Sorry? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I present the regular monthly resolutions 1A and 1B have been through committee and I present them to you for a vote. On favor. Aye. 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 All opposed? And, uh, Ms. McNabb and Coleman Ways and Means. I present the Ways and Means WM1 have been through committee and I present them to you for a vote. Ms. Webb? Any request for roll call vote? Yeah. Any discussion? Yes, what? Just out of, out of curiosity on this one, do we have any control over this? As far, I mean, th these are presented to us by the towns, right? Yeah. Through the real property office. So if we don't agree with these rates, what leverage do we have? So what if we vote it down? Well, make everybody happy. I'm a definite yeah. no. <laughs> well, it wouldn't make, wouldn't make our employees happy. <laughs> but, yeah, the equalization rates are set by the state, correct? Yeah, this is a, they, I believe we vote on it, not so much to approve or disapprove, but rather for the purposes of, of, uh, of a tax billing. It's a formality, a step we have to take. The, uh, well, I don't even know if we, can we legally change them? I would think not, but. Just a question then. Like in our town, with the reavail, when you're voting on this, has it caught up? Because I still read where like IRA is 94%, but we're supposed to be 100. So are we voting on something that's changing? I mean, I guess I don't. I don't think these are these are the current equalization rates. Is that correct, Doug? Yes. If the assessor would have had an opportunity to. Um, voice their opposition with the number that the state came up with, and there's a window of opportunity to do that. And once that period has passed, these rates become final. And as the chairman said, the purpose for adopting this resolution is to authorize me to use these numbers to portion the taxes uh, for the budget that you'll vote on in the next month. Yeah, and I think it, it, it is important to to clarify, the fact that someone has done a reevaluation does not mean they will be at 100%. It means that they've gone through a reevaluation, and in that assessor's opinion, it's, it's marked value. The state then looks at that, and they, they apply a, a, a number of, of, they have three statistical models they use and do some other things, and they say, yes, this is, 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 is right or it's not, and then there's this discussion with the assessor in the towns. So, I mean, that's kind of generally the process. Is that accurate? Ms. Whitman? Lloyd likes when we have conversation in this meeting, so we'll pick this one to drag through the mud. But <laughs> um, So I, I guess part of my curiosity is, 
these, these rates are all over the place. Some are at 100%, some of them are in the, the mid-80s. So we would have no leverage of trying to equalize to even these out within the county and get our, our county kind of squared away on an even scale. Well, that's what the equalization rate intends to do, to even out from town to town. The, uh, uh, right, but we don't have any leverage to get the towns to... No, right, no. And that's one of the things, by the way, there is some interest in shared services in, in pursuing this, and the shared services an issue with some, some towns. But fundamentally, we don't have any leverage. <coughs> Ms. Baxter. Mr. Chairman, in the past, uh, the state has offered incentives. Uh, 12, 14 years ago, Moravia did a reval, and this, <clears throat> every year, for, I think it was for five years, if you kept your evaluation up at 100%, the state paid you like $5 per parcel. So if you had, you know, 1,000 parcels, the state paid you $5,000. Thereby, it made it worthwhile to keep them up to date. That's a limited term, so once that expires, uh, they tend to let it slip. But I, I believe the taxes are, the county levies taxes based on the total value, not on the, uh, you know, help me with the word, Kelly. Yes. Yeah, because you, you, you say you're at 50%, but, but my neighbor's taxes in the same house that I live in are the same as mine even if I'm across the road in another town, they're, they're basically taxed at, uh, you get your 100% of tax even though their evaluation is down. In theory, you know what yeah. I mean? If, right. uh, yeah. That sort of equalization is tended to do exactly. Yeah. And I think that state program is long gone, is it not? Are we ready to vote? Can you take this and read it just like you did um, <coughs> this morning? Mr. Chair, and there oh, a just a clarification. Is this for WM1 or, or are these bundled? <coughs> WM1. Yeah. WM1. Yeah. This is one. And these ones, when you say you need to say that they're exposed. Tucker Wetman? Yes. Andrew Dennison? Yes. Benjamin Vitale? Yes. Grant Kyle? Paul Pinckney? Yes. Aileen McNabb Coleman? Yes. Joseph DeForest? Yes. Terrence Baxter? Aye. Joseph Bennett is excused. Frank Reginelli is excused. Patrick Mahonick? Yes. Timothy Lattimore? No. Michael Didio? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Brian Foley? Yes. And Keith Batman? Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Ms. McNabb and Coleman for WM2. I'm going to present WM2 was added on 1019. It's a resolution authorizing the cancellation and refund of a penalty and interest of $29.55 on tax map number 145 um, and $143.91 on tax map number 115. Um, this was discussed uh, at Ways and the treasurer said he would bring it to um, today's meeting. So uh, we need a motion for this. So is there discussion on this one? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And now Mr. DeForest for Health and Human Services. I'm actually going to do WM3. I see that was added also. Oh. Sorry, Mr. DeForest. Uh, this was added on 1020, uh, setting the date for public hearing on the 2018 preliminary county budget with any changes, alterations, or revisions. This also has not been through committee, so it needs to motion. Moved. Second. <coughs> so, any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And now for Mr. DeForest for Health and Human Services. Any discussion? All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. All opposed? And now, Mr. Foley for Government Operations. Government Operations has two resolutions. Um, both have been made and passed. I offer them up to this body. Any discussion? It's been, it's been through. It's okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Do we have a motion? I don't need a motion. Motion, a second. Brian Bogan. Yeah, Mr. Pinkney for planning. Planning has one resolution. It's been through committee and seek approval. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Mr. Baxter for public works. Mr. Chair, Public Works has seven resolutions. PW2 failed at committee. I would like to bundle one, three, four, five, six, and seven if there are no objections. And any discussion? Could you repeat the bundle again, please? One, three, four, five, six, and seven. Thank you. Do you want any of those pulled out, Mr. Pinkney? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? <coughs> and Mr. Mahunik for judicial and public safety. Judicial and public safety is very efficient, therefore we only have one resolution. <laughs> it has been through both committees and I ask for your support. Any discussion? Can we pull uh, JP1 out for a discussion? <laughs> <laughs> it's a. I'm sorry. Why are you consider it out. <laughs> so, the uh, discussion. No, I wasn't there. <laughs> discussion? Hearing none. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So we have uh, one other piece of business today. I think it's on the, uh, oh, okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, have a, uh, I forgot to mention that we did do some interviews for the uh, opiate lawsuit. That yes, we're going to discuss that right now. 
right now. Yeah. So, Ms. McNabb, call me. Mr. Chairman, we continued that discussion of the opioid lawsuit uh, in ways and means, so I have some information to present. Um, Nathan's going to present and then we can discuss. Uh, some counties in New York State are pursuing joining an opi opioid litigation on behalf of government entities. Opi opioids are effective treatments for short-term post-surgical and trauma-related pain, as well as for end-of-life care. There is an overarching theme of this lawsuit that gets at the heart of the deception that opioid pain medication is not addictive and safe for long-term use. The lawsuit seeks to achieve financial recovery for each municipality for the local costs associated with this epidemic, including substance abuse programs, insurance slash Medicaid, lost productivity, foster care costs, Narcan training and supplying, and increased law enforcement. Um, so at Gover Government Ops, uh, we invited a few law firms, and Fred will interrupt me if I step over the line here. Um, it, since we are in a public session, if we do re if we re uh, say a law firm's name or talk about anything that has to do with litigation, specific litigation, we have to move to executive session. So that's why I'm going to look at you and you just wave your arms if I'm... I'll, I'll stand up. Thank you. Um, so um, we we um, invited in a couple of law firms, a few law firms, interested in filing actions on behalf of the county. So on 11, October 11th, we spoke to these firms in executive session and today we would like to discuss whether or not Cuba County should move forward and join this litigation. The filing actions are against manufacturers and distributors of opioid pain medication, although particular firms are looking at a four-pronged pr approach uh, and are looking to investigate manufacturers, distributors, pharmacies, as well as doctors. Um, so we want to talk about uh, whether or not we, need to, we would like to enter into um, this suit, and um, I do have some other points of information uh, as we get into discussion. Do we want to go over anything else before we discuss? Or? Yeah, you might as well. Sure. Um, so some of the, and Mr. Foley, you can jump in when you, if, if I'm excluding you're, anything. You're good. Over Mr. Some firms, or Mr. Latimer, some firms indicated uh, that much of the information used in data collection is already public and would be coming through billing codes, codes for their data. So staff time was a huge concern. Um, if we entered into this lawsuit, would our staff have to sit with um, these law firms or the or people they outsource to for their data compilation to um, spend all the staff time uh, relaying this information? So that was a huge concern for us because they're busy enough. So, um, so uh, we found out that a lot of this would be done through billing codes. Um, there is no upfront money required on behalf of the county to enter into a lawsuit. Um, if they settle, Recoup costs are directly linked to departments of the county and their relationship to damages recovered. So the damages received are not assigned as across the board recovery to many counties, but it's directly related to the number of deaths in Cuga County as it relates back to opioid use and prescriptions. Uh, another point of interest is that NYSAC has endorsed a couple of firms, um, and there's another firm that's local. Um, we found out that particular firms have uh, signed on with uh, different counties, one being with Onondaga, one, <coughs> one being with Oswego, excuse me. <clears throat> um, and I just wanted to note in other counties in New York State and across the country, their damages would be very significant um, as they have county-owned hospitals, much larger DSS, much larger population, law enforcement, um, and so on. So. Um, those are just relative points of discussion that we that we covered, um, and I'm not sure if Mr. Foley, or Mr. Latimer, or Mr. Baxter have anything to offer. Yeah, you did well. Thanks. Appreciate it. I think Ms. Oh, did you have a clarification? Before yeah. We... Well, no, I, I was just going to add on to what she said. <clears throat> um, the committee uh, did well. Some of the other questions that people might have um, that were we asked of all three firms were. Um, what is your average time of trial, uh, or what, what do they think, how long this would take? Um, I think answers range from uh, two years to six years. Um, other questions also asked uh, were, uh, do 
you have a certain amount in reserves to continue the fight so that since they are putting up their own money, um, they're not requiring counties to pay anything. Uh, what happens in the case of them running out of money during the process or during the litigation, if it goes on for an extended period of time, uh, those were answered <coughs> adequately. Um, and also, um, one of the big concerns that I heard from the committee um, was how do they not run into, how do they collect data and information from us and not run into HIPAA violations in terms of getting very, uh, sensitive information from us and they all said that they had uh, specialized people on staff um, that were able to collect data without getting that specific type of personalized data. So uh, that was just an addition I wanted to, to add uh, to the legislator in the camp. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lamb. Just this past week, I think I've had three or four in my district uh, overdose uh, and die. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Mahonick. Uh, in the past, uh, he was smart enough to go against big tobacco and educate our, our population in regards to big tobacco advertising. Uh, this body stood up and was strong against that. And I know that we received $60 million from, from big tobacco. Um, I think that maybe some of those resources, maybe we misplaced where they should have gone. Hopefully with this lawsuit and uh, any settlements, we can keep that money and, and try to educate the kids uh, uh, coming up so that they, uh, or provide when they do get addicted, that we can provide long-term term care for them. So hopefully we'll handle the monies uh, much better in the future. Ms. Webb. My, my concern with this, th this lawsuit is to recoup money spent by the county due to opioid addiction. I don't think we're going to get $60 million. I don't think we've spent anywhere near that. Um, and what we have is a heroin epidemic that people are dying from. And I keep asking the question, and I'm kind of not getting an answer, so it's telling me we can't say who has died from prescription opioid overdoses in this county or what that has cost us. If we don't have the paper trail, we're not getting a dime. Um, <coughs> we have a lot of people overdosing on heroin. I don't think, I could be completely wrong, but nobody can present the paperwork to show how many op prescription opioid overdoses we've had in this county. I don't think we have that. And everybody, I think we're thinking big tobacco money, I think we're gonna be disappointed and to spend the next two to six years dragging ourselves through this lawsuit, I, I think we're gonna regret it. And all we're gonna do is make a bunch of attorneys rich in the meantime. Um, I'm really not a fan of this. It, the, the only way I would support this, and I, I said this in committee, the only way I can get behind this is any money we get out of this lawsuit is spent in rehab expenses to help people kick addiction, um, not on renovating the county office building. Right? It needs to get put back into the community for the problem. Mr. Dennis. It seems like we're trying to find every reason not to do this. And just recently in The Citizen, there was the article from our coroner, Adam Duckett, how overdose deaths keep increasing here in Cuba County. I think it's not, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, heroin overdose is part of this because the, you get hooked on the prescription drug. Then you're taken, that's taken away from you, and that's when they switch to heroin.